And uh, welcome everybody to tonight's legislative town hall. We have with us Representative Mike Peterson, Representative Dan Johnson, and popping in and out on occasion will be Representative Casey Snyder. And we are fortunate to have Emily Davis, Representative Snyder's intern on to ride shotgun. Let's uh, turn to you, Representative Peterson. What's going on in your world? So if that's all right, Jeff, I'll tell you, I'll take just a minute and tell you about, uh, yeah, what's going on in my world, which is um, I have a bill, I have a bill focused on bringing the Ten Commandments back into our schools. Those of us who are old, older remember that the Ten Commandments was a ubiquitous part of our education. It was, and it was, uh, it was everywhere. Um, in fact, from the, from the founding of the country, it was in textbooks and it was, you know, the Ten Commandments was everywhere. Um, so so I, I'm, I'm trying to look at a way to bring the Ten Commandments back into our schools so that, so that school children can see how the Ten Commandments is such a, a foundational piece of Western law, American law, how it's such an important part of American heritage, which it, which it is. I mean, that's, that's why if you walk into the Supreme Court and you look and see Chief Justice Roberts and the rest of them, there's Moses, and, and he's he and the Ten Commandments are 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 found within the 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 walls of of that Supreme Court building multiple times, and in multiple uh, uh, court buildings across this country, and and just it's like I say, it used to be ubiquitous. I've had people write to me and say, "You don't know the Constitution. You you don't know about separation of church and state. What are you doing? You're you're going to waste a lot of money on this." Well, let me tell you, first of all, um, putting the Ten Commandments back into the schools is not an unconstitutional act. In fact, as of 2022, the, the, the Supreme Court has ruled that, that this kind of thing can happen. This is what happened. In 1971, the Supreme Court settled a case called Lemon uh, versus Kurtzman. And they created what they called the lemon test, a three-pronged test that they said if 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 a if an item is this, this, or this, it's religious and it can't be can't be shown. Well, in 2022, they threw that out, said that thing was completely a, a mistake. And they came up and said, from here on out, as long as something has uh has historical significance, if it's if it's a traditional thing that's been in uh, that's been in public buildings. It could be it could be uh, brought back in. So first, my first point is this: having the Ten Commandments in schools is not uh, is not a new thing. It's just a restoration of something that was erroneously uh, um, taken out fifty something years ago. And so and so, um, I think that to, to to deprive our school children of knowing this piece of history that that. Uh, document influenced greatly our founders. It, it influenced again Western law, American law. It, it, it influenced how our how our founders, how the colonists treated each other with these Ten Commandments. And so, it's I think it's an important thing that we that we bring it back bring it back into schools. And 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 I think it's 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 too it's too bad that we took them out. And again, it was it was a, it was a mistake to take them out. Now, a lot of people have said, but what about the separation of church and state? Well, Jeff, I'm sure you know where that phrase comes from. Which 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 founding document, Jeff? <laughs> uh, it's not in any of the ones that I've read. No, it's not in any of the founding documents. It's a it's it's a, it's it was a, a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote January 1st, I think it was, of 1802, in response to the Danbury Baptist Association of Connecticut. Now, at that time, you got to remember, there were nine states. Nine states had a state religion. In, in, in Connecticut, their state religion was Congregationalism. And again, this was the Baptist Association. So they write to Thomas Jefferson wanting to know what's going to happen to us, because in, in, in these states, if you weren't part of the state religion, there could be reprisals. They're looking at the First Amendment, and they they recognize that it was written by man. And so they're worried. 
this is a is this a government given right? Could it be taken away in our right to 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 practice as Baptists? Will that be taken away so that only the so that only the Congregationalists can can practice? So he wrote a letter in response to them, and in there is this phrase: a separation of of, of a wall of separation between church and state. But what his intention was was to, it was to make clear to them and to help them feel comfortable that hey, the government's not going to interfere with you. You can practice your religion. We're not going to prevent you. But unfortunately, uh, sometime in like the 1960s, early 1960s, it, it got twisted. See, for the first several hundred years of our of our of our nation, whenever this idea of, of church and state was brought up in courts, it was always brought up in context of his letter. Well, in 1960 something, I can't I, I can't remember the date. Somehow it got. That phrase got pulled out of that document and set on its own. And on its own, you don't know what it means, separation of church and state. And so things got things just got really out of whack. That's why I say in uh, two years ago in, in, in 2022, the, the, the Supreme Court looked at that and said, hey, that this is not what was intended. And, and the lemon test, the lemon test is, is a mistake. And so what I'm trying to do now is to say, look, <clears throat> in our in our state statute for American history, we we outline several um, several documents, historical documents that students should study: Constitution, Declaration of Independence, uh, the, the 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 Mayflower Compact, and so forth. Um, and I'm saying there's like ten or twelve of them, and I'm saying let's also insert the Ten Commandments. By the way, this is a such as. So the the line says. Students should study these doc important uh, historical documents, such as. So it doesn't mean you have to. It means such as. And again, we're just sticking the Ten Commandments and actually the Magna Carta in in this list that our that so our our, our teachers can know that they are um, free to teach this, and our students are free to to learn from it. You know, I'll tell I'll tell you uh, this will be my last comment. This. This colored, this um, affected, influenced so much of our founding, and I would, in fact, argue that that um, without without this sort of a of a mindset that they that they received from the Ten Commandments, which, by the way, you think about our our laws, thou shalt you know you can't murder, you can't steal; those are all this where they controversial stuff. But but this is where this is where they got the idea really to abolish slavery. You think about that. You think about the commandment that says that that to keep the Sabbath day holy. That was the first time in history where somebody was set, told even even the slaves get a day off, and 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 it's and it's that mindset. It's these ideas that come from those Ten Commandments that really abolished helped uh, helped to abolish slavery and other things over the course of of generations. So. There you go. I, I just wanted to clarify because I, I've gotten uh, a lot of emails, a lot of concerns about, you know, are we going to do something that's going to bring up lawsuits? No, this is not going to bring up a lawsuit. Um, this is completely constitutional. There, this, is, this is not going to be an issue. So there you go. Thanks okay. for letting me share that, Jeff. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for thanks for doing that. Uh, Representative Dan Johnson, what's going on in your world? Well, <clears throat> thought I would just visit with you a little bit about yeah, the legislature in general from last time that we met up to today. I don't know if people know it, but we start uh, each of the morning sessions with with a prayer and we say the Pledge of Allegiance. And uh, there's always really, really nice moments. And uh, the uh, leadership of the House allows representatives to invite different people that that they want to come and one say a prayer and the other one will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. And I, I think, uh, and he asked everyone on the floor, all the representatives to stand and their guests and then everyone in the gallery uh, to do the same. So I don't know if people knew that, but, but, uh, but we, but we do do that. And I think it's really nice. One of the things that Casey mentioned just a minute ago, we got, uh, I think some teaching the other day from, uh, Speaker of the House Mike Schultz about about the number of bills and that 
you know, we got to be careful about how that looks. That, you know, that it looks like it's too much. There's no way, you know, you know, you could have studied all of that, you know, this and that and the other from that st standpoint. And uh, so, you know, I think there's, I think there's value, you know, in finding some happy medium that looks like what we can, you know, do successfully. And, and I think the idea is that we do a better job, spend a little more time vetting bills before, you know, they come uh, to the house floor. So one of the things that we've all been busy with uh, this past week is the appropriation requests and presentations uh, in all of the, the various appropriation committees. And the, the, the way that will happen is that, that each of those committees are here in the next little while will begin to think about what their priorities are from that committee. And then all those, those priorities will be given to the Executive Appropriations Committee. And they'll try to make sense of it. So we won't really know what this budget is going to look like and what is actually going to get funded so that people know uh, until the last week or so of the legislature, which, you know what? <laughs> Tomorrow is February 1st, and, and uh, the end of February is the end of the legislative session. So, you know, we've moved through a lot of the days, a third of it already. And uh, so there are a lot of bills. Uh, we have bills that are circled, and that means they're still they're out, but they're still working on some language. We have quite a few of those that they got cleared off the board today. Uh, and then we have we have a lot of bills that have been heard in committees and now have been forwarded to the House. So in, people will see a lot of pieces of legislation. Uh, passed uh, over this next week or so, so that that that's really kind of uh, where we are and what's going on. Another thing I would I would say is that uh, we've had a lot of visitors at the Capitol, and it's really exciting to me. Like when you go outside uh, of the House chambers to hear the buzz that's going on. Part of it is is created by all the school kids who are there and on tours and you hear their voices and you watch them. It's pretty exciting. Down in the rotunda, there may be, uh, you know, some organization sponsoring a lunch or maybe it's almost kind of a show and tell sort of thing that goes on down in the rotunda and also down in the hall of governors uh, below, which is right below there. And, so, you know, I, th I think that we see a lot of a lot of energy that is going on uh, in in uh, in the state capitol. I think what I would say about all that is that, you know, I think people could be really, really proud of the fact that we have a citizen legislature and people come and go. People do the very best that they can. They try to learn as much as they can past things that, that matter and, uh, you know, try to hear the voices of people to, to end up with some of the best legislation, also appropriation requests that that really do fund important, important things. So uh, one of the things is, is that, you know, Senator Jerry Stevenson uh, does a lot with the budget and, uh, when we met with the Northern Utah Chamber Coalition this week, uh, yesterday, or actually this morning at 7 a.m., he mentioned that, you know, last year we put a lot of money in savings. And so on some of these projects, we can now, we, we've saved money, we can pull a little bit of that back. So that sounded a little bit better for the possibility of some one time funding and some ongoing funding. So what that means is like one-time funding and say it's a million dollars to request, you're gonna get that one time. 
and it might be you use it over a three-year period or something like that. Ongoing means that, say, you have 500000 but you would have that 500000 built in the budget year after year after year. So I just kind of wanted to explain that. So we have a lot of legislation bills. We have some bills that are uh, have uh, appropriation requests tied to them. We have some bills that have no money attached to them, but just code changes. And uh, so uh, all of those appropriation requests, whether they're an RFA request for appropriation that, that only has that, or if you have a bill that has an RFA attached to that, all of that money is put together so we don't make a mistake and leave something out and go, oh my gosh, we passed the bill, but we didn't fund it. And so by taking the appropriation request from a bill and combining it with the regular uh, request for appropriation, we make sure that, that the money request that the executive appropriations group sees is accurate. So I hope that helps with people's understanding of what's going on right now. Um, I'll just kind of give you a quick update on what's going on, and then I'm going to have to jump back into a, a bill discussion before everybody stops getting along. Um, but you know, this, this week's been uh, super productive. We've had um, a lot of great things coming forward. I've we got a fairly robust discussion about water that's moving up through um, the process. We, obviously, we got the big bills off the table that the others can talk about uh, with DEI and 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 some transgender um, pieces of legislation. As I look forward into the next legislation legislative session, one of the things that we're really trying to manage against in the House, in particular, is there's a lot of legislation moving forward. And we're really trying to make sure that that's vetted. Last year, we set a record number of bills, passed a record number of bills. That's not always considered a, like something to be proud of, like a goal that we're necessarily shooting for. So uh, as I look at the future, there are bills that are stacking up. There are quality pieces of legislation, but it just it behooves us to be that much more responsible to the people of the state of Utah and ensure that bills are being thoroughly vetted and that you know, if we can, we're not passing more pieces of legislation than we have in the past. That's, I know that's a goal of the speaker that we're really working towards. So um, I'm going to be in and out guys. I apologize, but you're, you got the heavy hitters with Mike and Dan in here. So you don't even, you don't need me. So yeah, we do need you. <laughs> well, if you get bored, pop back in. Oh, I won't be bored, but I would rather be here than there. I promise. As long as it's not one of my bills you're working on. No, it's one of mine. Okay. <laughs> Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, I have some I have some questions. Uh, if you uh, don't mind me asking a few of them, I uh, um, one of the questions that uh, some of the uh, people I hang out with are, are asking uh, HB one twenty six um, has a provision in it that is eliminating uh, the ability of counties to exempt certain large vehicles from emission limits. Uh, yeah, I, I know a little bit about that actually. Great. And that that is, there, there'll be some exemptions that will be given so that some of those things that you just mentioned, types of maybe larger diesel trucks, for example, th there'd be, you know, uh, some exemptions from that because that that could be very limiting to to in society right now. I think you know it's like you know I don't think any of us like dirty air or, or water that's not clean. But we also have to understand that there's a process to make change, and you know we can't eliminate all the things that happen with large motor carriers and then all of a sudden not be able to do that. That just doesn't work. Society cannot work that way, but we can work towards some limiting in a reasonable way uh, in the future. So personally, that's how I see those things. I, okay. I, uh, I, I just think we, we, can, we can do things that really help 
with clean water and clean air, but we also need to understand there's a process and time that needs to be given in order some of those changes to be made. You know, uh, I, you know what, Jeff, I, I mean, I, I just take that for example, like, you know, Southern Utah and, and coal fired, uh, uh, plants and, 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 and carbon emissions and things like that. I don't want that stuff, but you know what? Uh, we can't supply all of the needs of electricity with, with wind. I mean, that, you know, it's, it's going to take a while before we can transition, you know, appropriately from coal and uh, oil and natural gas. Those are going to be components of how we move our state forward for quite a while. And we have lawsuits against the EPA pushing back on that because the EPA is forcing Utah to do certain things. And you're like, what are you going to do to turn the lights out in southern Utah? That that doesn't that we can't do that. So I'm I I'm. I'm pretty adamant about my feelings about that. I think I think we've got to be careful moving forward. So, Casey, if you want to go next, if you want to go next, since you might need to sneak out, and then I'll jump in after you're done. Well, and the only reason, so I have a great intern here from Utah State who is helping me hear the questions without. Anyway, so Emily's awesome. So Emily, say hello to everyone. Hi. Thanks. So. Um, so Stoddard's bill actually came to Natural Resources Committee and he held it because it has significant problems. It should honestly, I I I appreciate what <laughs> Representative Stoddard is, is is a good guy to work with, but on this issue, I couldn't disagree more. It basically, in my opinion, <clears throat> renders almost valueless every diesel truck in the state that is was manufactured prior to 2010 because you can't register it. Right. And it says unless it has an emissions, a piece of emissions equipment on it, you can't use it. Now, Cash County, fortunately enough, is exempt from that. But all of the Wasatch Front in that entire space, you would not be able to buy, sell or register a diesel commercial vehicle. It's crazy. And so and this is so I have that conversation with the representative. I also have that conversation with the AQ today. Uh, in nearly every one of these air control provisions, whether it's emissions, whether it's uh, what we're trying to do with lawn equipment, and in this case, commercial vehicles, the only long-term solution that actually works is, is twofold, improvement in technology and the market. People will buy a new, more fuel-efficient truck when it makes economic sense. They will convert to alternative fuels when it is commercially viable, and on the back end, the oldest and most polluting vehicles will fall off when it is no longer commercially viable to repair them. We don't need the heavy hand of government forcing this issue. It, it's, it doesn't work. It erases wealth for some uh, companies and individuals who can least afford it. We, we should just allow technology and, and the market to move us forward. That's why that, that approach that the state of Utah has generally been sticking towards is why now in 2024, we have the cleanest air that we've ever had in Cash County. I mean, that's hard to imagine, but the air is cleaner now as an average than it's ever been before. And that is because technology has moved us forward and the market has moved us forward. So anyway, that's, that's my perspective. Okay. And, and, and that and that's why, you know, we had a we had a presentation last week from from Peter Huntsman from the Huntsman Chemical. I can't I can't remember what the conglomerate's called right called now, but <clears throat> per capita CO2 is what it was in 1900. Because we because we're becoming more and more and more efficient and effective. And when you look at our coal, our coal plants, you know, uh, Representative Johnson alluded to the fact that the federal government's pushing us. They want us to close our, our, our plants. But, but they, the fact of the matter is the air that comes into that plant is, is cleaner when it leaves than when it came in. That's the first part I would make. And then uh, uh, Representative Snyder mentioned about DAQ. I was in a I was in a uh, presentation with DAQ not too long ago, 
And they made the point, um, to be honest, I think it was sort of accidentally, I read the slide and, and asked for some clarification, but most of our bad air in Utah doesn't isn't Utah air. It's air that we brought in from someplace else. And so, and then, but then the, my last point I would make on this is that for me, I, I don't want, I don't want as a state to be telling every county, I mean, there's, there's times when it's appropriate, but man, we should not be telling every county how to do their business. And this thing doesn't make any sense that, that, that a truck would be traveling from Cache County all of a sudden, er, you can't, you're not licensed to come into here. You know, what, what are you going to do? So there you go. All right. Great. All right. I have a question. Uh, HB 157 prohibits child protection services from removing a child from a home if the parents do not use their preferred pronouns. How do you feel about that? Well, I'll tell you, I have not seen that bill, but um, I, I don't think maybe, maybe we did. Let me let me look. But but obviously we 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 no, that's crazy. We don't we don't take kids because their parents won't use the pronoun that the child wants. It did pass through House Judiciary eleven zero one, so it'll it'll come out of the to the House for for a. Okay. But it's 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 going to pass. We're not going to we're not going to have that happen. Who's running that bill? Uh, Gracious and uh, it's Gracious and Kennedy. Yeah, Senator Kennedy. Yeah. So that'll be that'll be uh, two people on the conservative side of things. It, it it's funny, Jeff. But some of these things we just you know we're, we're uh, I like what sometimes when we're taking a proactive. Rather than wait till something bad happens on some of these things, let's take a proactive stance and make sure it can't happen here. You had Jeff, if it's all right, I'll, I'll sure, uh, go ahead. About, uh, Representative Jack's bill about um, uh, uh, closing a um, uh, coal plant. Yes. And, uh, uh, okay, so, we so voted I, on that yesterday or the day before in our uh, uh, utilities. Public Utilities, Electron, uh, Electricity, and or Energy and Technology Committee. So <clears throat> what we're saying is Rocky Mountain or whomever cannot, cannot close a plant unless there's another way to make sure we have that energy. Because this is the problem. We have, we have, um, you know, we have we have uh, these 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 manufacturers of energy, and they are feeling pressure from other states who buy the energy, and they say, we don't want any energy that's not made from nuclear or not made. Well, they're not saying nuclear from hydrogen, for example. Well, they're a customer, and so and so the the companies here are saying, boy, we better we better get rid of our coal plants and do that, and we're saying not so fast. If you don't have a way to make sure we have energy. You can't shut that down. You can't say no. You know we, we we're we're not going to be left like Senator John, Representative Johnson said earlier. We, we're not going to allow ourselves to be left not being able to turn the lights on. We that, that's not going to happen. It's an inter interesting, Bill. Um, you know, the power company is a in, independent business, and who are we to tell them they can't close a plant? But this is this is a little different because they provide a uh, you know a service to the to that, that's why we have the uh, that's why we have departments of the, the, this kind of thing. You're right. It, it, you have to you have to go through your hierarchy of principles and you say okay, free market. I mean that's near the top of of my list. But if the free market is going to is going to harm the Utah citizens, this is happening because the federal government overreach. And the EPA says you got to do this and this by this amount of time. Utah has pushed back on our governor, has sent a letter, and uh, if they formed a lawsuit about that, that you know what, uh, everybody you know in the legislature and in the executive branch are really pushing back uh, against that e EPA ruling. You know, Governor Cox wants to get rid of income tax. Uh, let's call his bluff. We, we we all do. 
but somewhere the money's going to come from someplace. Well, that's true, and uh, it would be okay if the legislature spent, you know, uh, half a billion less and and reduced services. I don't know if the legislature ever consciously walks around and says we can get rid of that program. Early on in the session, we have the LFA, the um, what is LFA, the Legislative Fiscal Analyst. Fiscal Analyst. They look at each at each um, for, for each one of these appropriations committees. They they look at they take a first cut at what programs could be cut. So we got we got a whole list of of items to cut to try to save some money. And I'm sure I'm sure they did there. And I know in in the social services we get this long list of things, and then you end up with the you know the the, the for my in my case now each university comes to comes to my door and says, hey, we're on the list to get this removed. We can't we can't afford to have that be gone. We need it because of such and such. And they have to they have to sort of claw back and 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 satisfy why do they need that money. So there are there are things that are that, that do happen. Not certainly not as much as I as I wish, but I think there are attempts. Unfortunately, you know, for every for every dollar we we claw back, there's Five dollars that we that, that people request to spend someplace else, you know. Mm -hmm. I uh, I think what we should do as much as we can is provide in the WPU the weighted pupil unit, and then other pl places where we have some money for counselors. Send that to local school districts. If they think that's a need for them, then they should make that decision there. But I, you know, I. I worry about uh, us getting into a situation where, you know, we're we're making school districts then dependent upon the state, you know, to always fund the purchase of of the, these uh, uh, counselors. And I think I think counseling is really important. Uh, I'd like to see a counselor in every elementary school and a few of them in every junior high and in the high school. Because as kids move along, that career counseling becomes really, really important. What you know, what are those interest surveys that kids take? Like, you know, what do you think you like? What skills do you have? What makes what makes you sort of tick? And, and I think it's important for kids to be able to think about that just a bit. So I am in favor of career counseling. I'm not sure that's the way to fund it. Is there anything else that you guys would like to close with? Yeah, I, I could for just a minute. Mike at the beginning talked about one of his pieces of legislation, but I presented uh, I presented in four different committees today. And so I was running from one place to the other and switching gears about the concepts involved. But one of them is that I, that I, uh, presented. Matter of fact, all four of them were passed unanimously and in the in the committees where I presented today. But I think they're good bills and they they try to help people. Uh, one of them is the salary supplement for speech language pathologists and audiologists. These these folks uh, they they sit on, on all IEPs and sometimes on 504s to think about what kind of needs the kids have and how will we address them if they have speech problems or if they have hearing problems. I mean, when you think about it, that severely inhibits a person's life if you don't teach them ways to overcome it. And their, their, uh, their load is overwhelming. Uh, they'll have 75 to 100 people on the caseload. They have to go to all those IEPs. Uh, and just think about how you schedule that. Plus, they have to deliver all the services that everybody agreed to in that IEP meeting, because that's a contract for the delivery of services. So you don't get to just sort of guess what you're going to do and uh, you know that kind of thing. So it's 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 really important work. And it it's life changing for the kids, and I've I've seen that over 
you know, years and years of sitting in on meetings where that was done and then watching the changes that were made in kids uh, if for the good. So I, I really support that bill. Uh, the other one is like a really important one too, is I did one on emergency medical services so that, you know, like for me, most of you know that I had a recent uh, issue and, and it wasn't very, very good. 911 had to be called. And what this bill would do is that the, the uh, EMS cannot currently get a hold of anybody and find out any information about me. So this bill would change that. And it, it does not violate any HIPAA laws. So there could be an exchange of information about the patient, not anybody else, the patient you're delivering services to when a 911 call is made and people, you know, the EMT uh, uh, trained people show up, but then they could have an exchange of information with a provider. Say for me, it would have been with Logan Regional Hospital. They could have called up all kinds of things. That guy just had open heart surgery, blah, blah, blah. They would know right exactly what to do. And then by that exchange of information, uh, if you would like go say we're taken to a, an emergency room, those emergency room doctors would know what the EMT guys and gals had done. So I think that's gonna be a really interesting and important piece of legislation moving forward. Uh, and so that I presented that today. Uh, the other one I, I wanted to visit with you about is, is the uh, state online education uh, uh, program I presented that one uh it is a it's it, it's a very important piece of legislation because we have more and more parents parents at home school if, if parents of kids in a charter school parents of kids in a regular public school uh, I think I mentioned private so everybody in in our state can have equal access to online programs if that's what they want. So it levels the playing field. And then I think for the future, one of the things that somebody else is going to need to take a look at is what are the quality of those programs? Because I think that's a different discussion, but that is not in this bill. That is not the intent of the bill. The bill is to get some counselors in the state office of education that can help with the moms and dads as they try to navigate the, uh, the system so that they can get engaged in, in a course. And everything is clunky. It doesn't work very good. So part of this bill creates the opportunity for that the back end uh, you know, technology piece gets fixed so that the, the users out there uh, and all these online providers can have easier access, better outcomes, uh, with kids getting into courses, having follow-up and feedback. So that's a big deal. And so I, I presented that today. Another thing that I presented today was our state has been one of the best states in the nation because our people here, they understand uh, what it was like to have religious issues and they, they, they were pushed out of where they lived and uh, they came to another place to make a life, to live the American dream. Uh, no different than me. Uh, you know, I'm first generation American. Uh, my father was born in Sweden. He went over to, to uh, Liverpool, England. Uh, my, my, my father was 54 when I was born. And, uh, my father was born in 1893. And they, he and his family, his, his mother and father, my grandma and grandpa, who I never knew, uh, in 1898 came to America because they, they couldn't make it where they lived. And so, you know, they went past the Statue of Liberty and did all the Ellis Island things. Well, that's the same thing these people are doing today. They, some of them have been in war-torn countries and, you know, kids that have seen their mother and father executed 
it, it's, I mean, it, it's, it's sad. Some people have been in these waiting camps for years before they finally find a place in the world where they can go and start a life. And uh, so you the history resolution, recognizing the state of Utah for being, you know, a great place uh, for uh, uh, people to come and uh, to find a place to live and, and, and to begin to try to live the American dream like many of us and our forefathers and mothers did uh, in their life. So uh, that was, that, that was a, that's a really important resolution. And, and I was able to present that to committee today. So there's a lot of bills and important things, but they're ideas I think that matter, uh, you know, and, they, and they, they're helping, I believe they're helping people. So just wanted to share those things today. Thank you. Representative Peterson, last call. There we go. I, I, you know what? I'll just, I'll just end it with just thanks so much, Jeff, for putting this together, and thanks to all of our uh, constituents who write and text and call. Keep it up. I, I so appreciate knowing how you're feeling about things and what's going right and what's going wrong and what your concerns are because that uh, helps us as we as we make our votes and as we try to legislate. So thanks so much for for helping us and thanks again, Jeff. You're welcome. Thank you, Jeff.